Anthony, we're here at an FQFI conference focused on the physics of the observer and events. Um, we're also dealing with the question of, of the gap between life and non-life. Why is that a question for FQXI? It's, in some sense, there, when you think about it, there's sort of two different, qualitatively completely different sets of things in the universe. There's the non-living and there's the living. And, and you know, although the living is a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the mass, um, it's sort of all important in a way. It's the only thing that, that really knows anything. It's the only thing that enjoys or has experiences and so on. And when you think about how you describe living versus non-living things, when you describe non-living things, all kinds of physics terms are useful, mass and angular momentum and wave functions right. and state vectors and, you know, depending on what sort of physics you, you want to use. But when you describe life, um, it's a whole, th those concepts are pretty much useless. They're, they're, they're there, certainly, you know, you can't change, I can't change my mass, mm -hmm. you know, it's fixed by the laws of physics, but... That's not the most interesting part of you. That, yeah, that's, that, <laughs> that's, that's not what you care about. You care about questions like, why is this organism doing what it, what it likes? How do I explain the behavior of this thing? And those explanations are completely different. They're operating at a different level than the physics explanations. So how are those compatible? Why, how can we sensibly talk about this moose wanders onto this pathway, you know, because it wants to get away from the bear, right. or uh, even this paramecium, you know, swims this way because it wants to get to the sugar, while at the same time, those things are governed by fundamental physical laws that you would think would would sort of prescribe their their actions completely. So although there's this one description that seems deterministic and tells them this is what they have to do, there's this other description in which they choose what they want to do. And so that's a really fascinating gap. And, you know, it, it brings in questions like free will, how do we choose if the universe is deterministic? But it, even at a more basic level, it brings in questions like if we want to describe some really simple system, is the best description in terms of atoms and, and electrons and stuff? Or is it in terms of information processing? Or is it in terms of desires? You know, teleology. Teleology is, is not what part of What the end physics. result is, what, right. they're, what they're heading towards. The paramecium going towards the sugar is right. a very specific teleology. The, you know, organisms want to survive. Their goal is to yeah. survive and reproduce. And that explains a huge amount of their behavior. It has no place in physics. You know, so how does teleology as an explanation, how you reconcile that with physics that has no place for that? Yeah, in fact, teleology is a dirty word in, in generally in, in science because you, you, you don't like to say what's happening now based on a, a future, but when you talk about life, that, that's an essential part of what right. we do. Right, if you try to talk about life without that concept, you're, you're tying both hands mm -hmm. behind your mm -hmm. back. You can't really do it. So how, how can you make progress? What, what, what are the avenues to explore? I think some of them are to, to sort of look at those in-between systems, look at uh, simple systems that have you know, that are close enough to fundamental physics that you can really understand them in those terms, but also complicated enough that their behavior actually has attributes of, of agency. What are, what are examples? So, for example, there's this classic question of Maxwell's demon. Oh, okay. uh, have you heard of this one? Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, so it's this little demon that sits and it, you know, measures particles, and depending on whether they're hot or cold, it lets them into one side of this room or another. So this demon can act against the second law of thermodynamics by taking a warm room and turning it into a hot room and a cold room. So how is that demon doing that? It's making measurements and it's making choices. It's an agent. So, so it has a goal, it makes measurements, it processes information, and then it takes action. Now it's a very super simple one. It doesn't have to be very smart. It just has to do a little bit. But you can analyze, you know, what is the cost of that agency? If you don't include that cost, you violate the second law. And the cost is, of course, energy. The cost is entropy, in a sense. Yeah. It's, it's information processing. So you can get a little bit of a handle, starting with even these very simple systems. How do we think of agency? How do we think of information gathering? How do we think of prediction or comparison between you know, what there is and what we want and deciding to take an action? Those feel like very high-level concepts, but they exist even in very microscopic things. And I think where there we can try to bridge that gap a little bit.